LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is former oil field executive Ian R. Crane. Ian has engaged industry sources and independent researchers to lay the foundations for his investigations into fracking, the mining of shale and coal seam gas. Ian asked whether this miracle of nature really will be the solution to our nation's energy problems. Is it going to be the best thing for us since North Sea gas? Or are there hidden dangers which could impact upon communities in ways which need open discussion? Across the UK, a backdrop of unemployment, national debt and austerity is creating a distraction from more long-term problems. While such issues will take decades to address, the potential hazards brewing in the background, which the wider public remain complacent about, are likely to take centuries to put right. Ian considers whether corporate profits are being put ahead of the health, safety and the well-being of our natural environment. We are subjected to increasing restrictions on food and health choices, all in the name of protecting us. We have more surveillance and monitoring to safeguard us and further restrictions on the media are forthcoming. Are such actions justified and considering our safety is supposedly paramount in these areas, will fracking be subjected to equal levels of caution? Hello and welcome Ian and thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the invitation. Now, Ian, you're currently in the middle of an extensive UK speaking tour, the most extensive tour you've done. You can tell us about that uh, later. Now, the title of your current talk is Fractured Future. It doesn't have to be this way. And the slightly different spelling of fractured points to the fact that the key issue that you're discussing is that of hydraulic fracturing, otherwise known as fracking. Now, quite a lot of talk in the media about this at, uh, at the moment and uh, many people will have heard the term fracking. They may even know that it's a form of oil production. But before we really get into this, perhaps you could set out briefly for people who don't know just some of the technical details of what this process involves. Yeah, Greg, this is uh, this is a very extensive tour. I, I've completed 14 dates of, of what is basically, I think, about a 65 plus date tour of the country, covering everything from um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, right down through uh, England, the Isle of Man, and indeed the Channel Islands. And the issue is, uh, the central issue, is obviously the fracking agenda. But I, I, as always in all my talks, I try and sort of put it in perspective, put it in context with the bigger picture, uh, explain why it is that in my analysis there is this focus on this particular aspect of of, uh, hydrocarbon extraction right now. Um, And also, obviously, try and provide some insights into possible alternatives. So I don't just leave leave people hanging with, you know, a statement that we shouldn't be doing this. But I appreciate that, you know, fracking is probably not a term that uh, rolls off most people's tongues, despite the fact that there has been a lot of uh, literally propaganda uh, put out um, in the mainstream media um, over the last particularly four months since mid-December of last year, when the moratorium on fracking was lifted by uh, uh, the uh, David Cameron and his cabinet. Now, just to sort of put this in perspective, what fracking is, is a methodology by which the geology is opened up to increase the porosity to enable oil or gas to migrate to the bottom of the well. So what we're talking about here is not a conventional well where you drill down, uh, you drill down to your required depth, where that you know that there's a a reservoir of oil or gas under natural pressure. 
you open up the bottom of the well by perforating the casing and then the oil or the gas, because it's under natural pressure, follows the path of least resistance and it goes into the bottom of the well up to the surface and then is shipped by a tanker or pipeline or whatever uh, to the ultimate destination. By going into a tight geology, if you just drop the well in there and uh, fractured, uh, sorry, just uh, perforated the, the casing, you wouldn't get very much in return because there's uh, very little in the way of natural pressure and anything that is under natural pressure would be fairly minuscule. So what you have to do is you have to create, if you like, an artificial means for the hydrocarbons to come to the bottom of the well. So when it's called fracturing, it is literally that. It is fracturing the rocks, fracturing the geology to open up the pathways. Now, this, this process is achieved by pumping phenomenal amounts of water and mixed with chemical cocktails down the well at extreme pressure. So the pressure is normally something in the region of seven and a half to eight and a half thousand pounds per square inch, um, which means that the integrity of the well has to be absolutely sound. Um, there, quite recently, actually, there was an incident in Oklahoma where during a frack job, the integrity of the well uh, wasn't uh, what it should have been. And the whole of the top half of the, the well blew out of the ground. Um, remarkably, only one person was injured, but that's primarily because, you know, when this is going to happen, there is a little bit of warning. But, you know, imagine something like that happening close to a residential area. Um, you know, the, uh, the impact would be much greater than, you know, in, a, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere. So the, um, once the frac fluid, this combination of water and uh, very toxic, very aggressive uh, chemicals is pumped down the hole, the problem is that no geologist and no petroleum engineer can absolutely guarantee where that fluid is going. So if the if the frack job was pure, then it would literally only um, open up the target geology. But as we've seen around the world, because the client companies, the oil companies want the most effective frack job they can possibly get. The companies employed to do the fracking, which is my former company, Schlumberger, I was 20 years with Schlumberger between 79 and 98, Halliburton, um, uh, BJ and Baker, Baker Hughes. These are the sort of primary companies that uh, fulfill these services. And because they want the client, obviously, to be happy, what they will do is they will make the frack fluid as aggressive as they possibly can. So once it's pumped down hole, it's literally a case of cross your fingers and hope for the best. And it, it, you, should, you should get your first clue when I tell you that it's actually considered a success if they're actually able to get 50 percent of the frac fluid black back to the surface. So in other words, 50 percent of this is lost underground into the geology, uh, migrating goodness knows where. Now, just to put this in perspective. To drill and fracture a well takes on average about four million gallons of water. In, the, in Michigan recently, there was a frack job that took 21 million gallons of water and they're going to frack another well um, in, in, a, in the same area very shortly. And that's estimated to require 16 million gallons of water. But the average is about four million. Now, let's assume that the wells in that are proposed for the UK, let's assume they take half that, which is eight, uh, two million gallons. But off of each vertical well, there could be as many as eight horizontal sections and, and even more if, uh, if they want to do them at multiple levels. But let's just say eight horizontal sections from a vertical well, that's potentially um, you know, 16 million gallons of water. And, and if there is six to eight vertical sections per square mile, each with eight horizontal sections, you know, we, we're talking, so we're, we're talking eight multiplied by six, we're talking 48, each of those wells taking two million gallons of water. So you're talking 96 million gallons of water per square mile. Now, the frac fluid additive is about 5% of the total, you know, and 5% and of um, 96 million gallons of water is uh, what's that about four four point two million gallons of toxicity 
added to the water that's pumped down the well and uh, potentially 50 percent of that is lost into the geology because what will happen is once it goes into the geology, it will find the path of least resistance. So some of the frac fluids may ultimately migrate directly into the water table. And those that don't migrate into the water table can migrate into other geology. And because they're still laden with toxicity and they're still technically aggressive, then they will open up that geology and create pathways for the gases to literally percolate up to the surface. And in the in the talks that I'm giving around the country, I show the physical evidence of water contamination, soil contamination and air contamination. Now, the background to all of this is because all of this sounds very hazardous and people might be asking, well, why is this taking place? But I think most people are aware that um, two words that go often together these days, energy and crisis. And we see the cost of energy for all of us, you know, domestic, industrial users uh, going up. Um, we hear talk about oil prices, generally speaking, going up, fluctuating somewhat and renewables failing to deliver on their promise, a lot of controversy surrounding nuclear as well. And then there's also the peak oil thesis. Um, so how do those play into what's happening? OK, well, first of all, I, I mean, you know, the whole peak oil thesis is a construct. I mean, it was a construct in 1957 when Marion King Hubbard, the author of Technocracy Inc., um, uh, presented his hypothesis. And the hypothesis was used 16 years later by Henry Kissinger and uh, James A. Baker III to effectively wind down domestic production of hydrocarbons in the US and uh, create the global economy. And, and I talked about this a number of years ago in a presentation that I recorded called Peak Oil Myth or Reality. And um, in fact, the, the confirmation of everything I uh, talked about uh, appeared in uh, the autobiography of Sheikh Imani, who was the secretary to OPEC in the 1970s. And, and basically, uh, Kissinger and James A. Baker III instructed Richard Nixon to remove the US dollar from the gold standard on August the 15th, 1971. Uh, up until that point, in theory, and indeed in practice, any US citizen could go into a bank, hand over 35 dollars and uh, get an ounce of gold in return. Um, in fact, just to give you an idea of uh, you know, what happened with the price of gold once um, the US dollar was removed from the gold standard, in 1830, the price of gold was $18 and a few cents an ounce. And it basically stayed there for 100 years until 1929. And then um, because of the, uh, the crash of 1929 to 1933, and that, that was a manipulated crash, which was ultimately acknowledged as uh, contrived by the Federal Reserve. The price of gold doubled in that period and it went to, from 18 to uh, 35 dollars. And basically it stayed at 35 dollars an ounce from 1934 until 1971. And then once the US dollar was removed from the gold standard. And then two years later, um, Kissinger and Baker took the opportunity of the Middle East crisis to go to OPEC and present a proposition to OPEC. And the proposition basically was that OPEC would increase the price of oil by 400%. But in return, in return, they would demand payment in the newly created petrodollar, thereby requiring countries all around the world to effectively um, uh, get a stock of petrodollars, buy a stock of petrodollars. Now, the deal was that OPEC had to be had to accept that it was going to be presented as the bad guys because obviously the Western media were going to blame OPEC for the increase in the price of oil. But it was engineered by Kissinger and James A. Baker. And, and part of that engineering um, to achieve that 400 percent increase was based on the construct that oil as a fossil fuel is a finite resource. And once people have it somewhere in the depths of their consciousness that something is a finite resource, then they can buy into the prospect of scarcity and uh, therefore um, pay the higher price. But I mean, let's just put something in perspective. You know, uh, nearly five years ago in July of um, uh, 2008, the price of oil hit $147 a barrel, right? 
Today, it is $90 a barrel. So, you know, right now, it's, um, what, what's that? It's about uh, uh, 70%, 65% of what it was five years ago. The bulk of the increase in the prices that people are paying is taxation. And, and this is the construct. So, and this is one of the reasons why we have a hydrocarbon economy. Because the most efficient way of collecting taxes after income tax is through taxes on hydrocarbons. And consider this, Greg, you know, what is outrageous is that we are paying more in tax on every litre that uh, we we buy at the pumps than we were actually paying for the price of uh, of a litre of fuel eight years ago. So despite this phenomenal increase in tax revenue, then, you know, the country's economy is still in a world of hurt. And since the current administration came into office, the debt has risen from 82 percent of GDP to 86 percent of GDP and, and, is, and is still rising, despite the fact that you know, the, there's been a phenomenal amount of, of increase in the tax revenues, particularly on hydrocarbons. And, uh, and you know, the bankers still can't um, uh, get enough of it. So, you know, people and what I try and do in my presentations is I show how basically everything is interlinked, that, you know, nothing is an isolated issue. And, and consequently, this drive for the land based shale gases, which is being presented by the government and the, uh, the media as the savior in terms of our energy security, um, it, it's going to give us the economic recovery that we desperately need, and it's going to create employment. I would say that every one of those three is a complete crock. Uh, the reality is that uh, shale gas is the low hanging fruit. It is quite possibly the, or perceived to be, the cheapest accessible hydrocarbons um, for the time being. And consequently, the oil and gas industry sees the potential for enormous profitability. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see significant reductions in in pricing. Um, any any profits are going to go to the corporations and uh, through um, uh, taxation. So, you know, the direct benefit to the British public is is going to be minimal. But the impact on the British public is going to be absolutely uh, enormous. Now, let me let me just say, Greg, that um, during the course of my presentations, I actually explained that we have never needed hydrocarbons in the sort of volumes that um, you know we use them today. You know what a lot of people don't realise is that Henry Ford was actually instructed to stop building the electric car in 1896. You heard that right. It was 1896, and. I'll give you I'll give you one guess, Greg. Who do you think it was who instructed Henry Ford to stop building electric cars? Oh, I should imagine some sinister figure in banking. Uh, well, almost. But uh, he hadn't quite made it big in banking at the time. But it was Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, the owner of Standard Oil. And John D. Rockefeller realized that, uh, you know, if he was going to maximize his monopoly of um, control of the hydrocarbons, in the in the US and uh, and beyond, then obviously, uh, you know, he needed the world to effectively depend, be dependent uh, upon hydrocarbons for its means of um, energy. So um, Henry Ford uh, had a, two production lines running in the 1890s. Two thirds of the production was for the electric cars, which were very popular in the US at the time because they were quiet, they were clean and they uh, required minimal maintenance. Um, in fact, it's a matter of public record that in New York City, obviously it was a lot smaller than it is today, but in New York City, there were 2,500 registered vehicles in 1896 and 1,800 of them were electric. And there was an infrastructure in place. Um, I mean, obviously people didn't commute the big distances they do today, but people could plug their cars, the wealthy could plug their cars in at home and then ride them into the city and then plug them into the, uh, uh, you know, the points uh, that had been purposely constructed in Wall Street and the like during the day and then drive them home again in the evening. Well, John D. Rockefeller wanted to shut down the electric cars. He wanted to encourage the uh, internal combustion engine because it needed oil. So what he did was he actually started uh, the process of buying up all the electric tramways that had been built in the cities around the US. 
And then he was introducing buses. And of course, the, the argument being that bus services were more flexible in terms of routes and, and could uh, uh, follow the um, changing demographics of the, the cities. And then over time, the tramways were shut down. And then as the personal motor vehicle became more affordable, then um, the bus services were wound down. And, and so this is how um, uh, basically the internal combustion engine and the hydrocarbons uh, reliance emerged. So, you know, here we are today. And, you know, what doesn't seem to uh, phase too many people is despite all the incredible advances in just about every other uh, technological field, you know, we are still reliant on our main means of transportation um, on, a, on a technology that's basically 130 years old. Now, the peak oil thesis that we referred to a few minutes ago um, is supported by you know, lots of figures, estimates of uh, remaining supplies, graphs, charts, you name it. You can go and find it online and lots of interpretation of this data to prove a case um, so what do you believe we're looking at in terms of if, if those are not to be taken literally? Uh, okay, well, or, or, first, of all, first of all, Greg, I would say that um, if you look at current information, um, the latest information, then, you know, the whole peak oil myth is exploded. You know, I made the observation six years ago um, in a debate with the founder of Transition Town, you know, who, who claimed that, uh, you know, we... We were using oil faster than we were finding it. And, and a few years ago, that was true. Um, and I made the observation. I said, look, you know, if you want to find something, you've got to look for it. And the problem was that back in the 70s, it was perceived that we knew where there were sufficient hydrocarbon resources to fuel the planet for the next 100 years. So through the 70s, the late 70s in particular, the 80s, the 90s and the early part of the um, of uh, uh, this century, there was really very little investment in seismic surveys. And, and let's not forget that in 1999, the price of a barrel of oil was $9.81. So you know, that's what the market um, um, was putting the, the oil out at because it was perceived that, you know, we had way more than uh, was needed. We had production capacity that was beyond what was needed. But then, of course, we have had the burgeoning economies of uh, certainly India and China. But, um, you know, let's take a look at the facts. You know, we have never yet been in a shortage situation. There has never been um, a situation where uh, we've been at risk of supplies not meeting demand. You know, the oil industry is a very mature industry. And it would be naive to believe that the leadership teams in these companies, and of course, you know, I was on the senior management team of Schlumberger, so I'm speaking from some experience. You know, it would be naive to believe that the senior management teams don't have contingency plans upon contingency plans upon contingency plans. I mean, that's what they're paid to do. You know, the, the price hike to $147 in uh, 2008 was a total manipulation. And, you know, now at $90, which it, it's been around that marker for the last probably, you know, couple of years, it goes up and down a little bit. But, you know, there is a direct relationship between the price of oil and the price of gold. And, and that's because the OPEC countries, uh, they've committed, obviously, to take payment in petrodollars. And then they spend those petrodollars in the dollar market, i.e. the U.S. economy, mainly buying arms. Um, but anything they don't spend, they need to put into something that's going to hold its purchasing value. So they go out and buy gold. So consequently, the price of oil um, has uh, followed the, the trend for the last uh, nearly 60 years. And apart from a couple of um, um, glitches over that period of time, the price of a barrel of oil has averaged 7.66 percent of the price of an ounce of gold. And and the price of gold, of course, has gone from thirty five dollars in August of 1971. It went up to nineteen hundred dollars in uh, the middle of 2011. Uh, right now it's down at about under uh, right now. It's down at uh, fifteen thirty five. Um, it's taken a little bit of a dive, mainly because uh, Cyprus has is trying to dump a whole bunch of gold right now to address its um, um, <laughs> collapsing banks. 
But, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, the price of gold has been around about uh, 1600, 1650. And, and consequently, the price of gold has held, uh, price of oil has held, you know, at its level of about $90. Now, it's true to say, obviously, that in the West, where we've had a, um, a hydrocarbons policy of literally sort of bleeding a reservoir dry uh, until it doesn't produce any more and then shutting it in and then going and looking somewhere else. Whereas in Russia, they have a completely different philosophy. And I mean, let me let me tell you, Greg, any any self-respecting geologist or petroleum engineer who tells you that they know definitively what the origins of, of hydrocarbons carbon, are, then they're not practicing epistemological integrity because the reality is it's an unknown. There is a hypothesis, but it's a hypothesis. It's not proven. In Russia, for example, for the last 70 years, they've had a completely different philosophy of oil exploration, production and reservoir management. And, and they work on the basis that oil is a naturally occurring self-regenerating fluid they don't they don't know how that happens but through their own studies and through their reservoir management they know that if you manage a reservoir correctly i.e., you monitor the initial pressure you um, monitor that very carefully and when the pressure drops to a sort of predetermined pre-calculated level you close the well in and you leave it lying fallow and then after a while Basically, the well would have returned to its original pressure and they'll open it up again. And, you know, there's a lot of effort to explain that phenomena, you know, using the Western philosophy like the oils migrating from other reservoirs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the bottom line is we don't really know. We just don't know. But it suits the West to maintain the belief that oil is a fossil fuel, because by definition, if it's a fossil fuel, it must be a finite resource. But, you know, like I said, let me make it very clear. We have never needed to use hydrocarbons in these quantities. Um, the alternative energy sources are deliberately suppressed by the hydrocarbons industry and by their complicit governments, because the governments absolutely need the or believe they need you know, that whilst we have a, a fiat economy um, based on debt, then obviously they need the revenues that the uh, hydrocarbons provide to be able to um, pay the interest on the debt, which in the UK now is pushing, you know, £100 billion a year. Well, I think it's significant that you're highlighting the fact that the oil use doesn't have to be so high and that there are alternatives, um, some, you know, more in development further down the line than others, because um, a lot of people who question the peak oil thesis are you know, said to be, and sometimes provably, you know, in the pay of oil companies, it's a very straightforward relationship that's always assumed to be, uh, you know, people who do question. Oh, people. Hey, it got, Greg, it cuts both ways, because some of the people who promote the idea of peak oil are in the pay of the oil companies. Because let me tell you that um, when the uh, stock price of oil companies and oil field service companies was ramping up, as the price of oil pushed towards $147 a barrel in 2008. I have a former co colleague. I'm not going to name him, but if somebody, anyone was really interested, they could check it out because it's a matter of public record because he was an officer of Schlumberger. He joined Schlumberger two years before I did in 1977. And uh, over the, uh, the duration of his 31-year career with Schlumberger, he accumulated a significant chunk of stock options. In um, uh, 2008... In, in June of 2008, he traded his stock options when the Schlumberger oil price, along with every other oil company or oil field service companies, stock price hit a peak. And in that one stock option trade, he made more money than he had earned in salary in the entire 30 years that he'd been with the company. So, you know, the Association for the Study of Peak Oil is also funded by the oil industry. So, you know, th this is a classic uh, example of the oil industry effectively funding both sides because it suits them to do so. Well, we we're talking about energy costs earlier. And of course, it's, we're, we're seeing energy costs sometimes spiraling is the only word you could use to describe the 
the price increases year on year. You're seeing the taxes spiralling. Of course, yeah. I'm thinking just literally, you know, the the, the net cost to households and to the end user, exactly. Yeah, and and businesses. And of course, the background to all of this isn't benign uh, by any means because we're in the midst of this. Well, I've been now since 2008 in the midst of a global economic crisis, and things on that front only seem to be getting. Uh, rather going from bad to worse. Well, it's a manipulated economic crash. I mean, listen, I, I produced a, a presentation in 2007 um, it, it called Hidden Agenda, and it was in July 2007. And in that presentation, I, I said we are literally on the cusp of the rug being pulled out from under the global economy. And you know, I didn't, I don't claim any special insight, but uh, you know, the reality is that what had occurred between 2002. And 2007 was exactly the same as what occurred between uh, 1925 and 1929. Massive amounts of of, um, liquidity had been pumped into the economy, obviously primarily as debt. So people were leveraged up to the hilt. And basically, this is the way in which the banks and the corporations used to effectively establish greater control and monopolize the economy. And, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, we saw it in um, the UK a month after I or two months after I recorded that presentation with the collapse of Northern Rock. You know, when Northern Rock went bust, it was still operating within the guidelines of the uh, Glass-Steggall um, legislation, which was established in after the crash of 1929-33. Uh, um, but unfortunately, the Glass-Steggall Act was repealed by Clinton um, as one of the last things he did in his term of office. And this created the opportunity for the banks to go into uh, effectively into the casino markets. And um, in 2008, you know, Northern Rock went bust when it was leveraged at nine to one. Um, when Lehman Brothers went bust, which was actually the trigger, the final trigger um, for the uh, the collapse. That, that was like the sort of final um, the bell, if you like. Uh, Lehman Brothers was leveraged at 27 to one. Uh, and of course, you know, it's since been alleged that um, JP Morgan have oversold their silver holdings by as much as 100 to one. Well, if that's the case, the price of silver will you know, go through the roof at, in, at some point in the future. You know, what's, what's happening is the bankers are literally playing the final round of their game of Monopoly. You know, um, and for anyone who's played Monopoly, of course, you know, the ultimate objective is last man standing. It's one person with total ownership of the board. And that's what the bankers are going for. And that's basically what they managed to achieve in Greece, in Portugal, in Ireland, in Spain, in Italy. You know, and the UK, you know, we're at 80 percent. Our debt level is 86 percent of GDP. When it gets to 100 percent, that's the point of almost no return. So, you know, and until such time as we have. Uh, a government that has the courage to do an Iceland and uh, you know reignite the economy based on um, government-backed money and not uh, fiat currency issued by banks, which the people have a um, a liability for the interest on in perpetuity, then you know we're we're going to continue down this spiral. You know the only good news is I suppose that because of the the magnitude of the levels of debt and austerity and everything else that's being foisted upon us artificially, then more and more people are actually waking up to the scam. So the, the fracking issue in, in this context really then is obviously it's being pursued for its own ends. People will make money out of it, but it's really part of something that can be pointed to as evidence for something basically that, oh, this is necessary and here's why. So even though we might look at this and go, this is a negative, that this is, you know, if you believe that this has to happen for our uh, country and lifestyle to go on the way it is, then you can see a negative. But also there's that there's a flip side of it. It's seen as evidence for something. OK, they have to do this. If you want to uh, if you want to sort of stay with the existing paradigm, I, I can certainly understand why it is that people fall for the um, very simplistic lines that, you know, yeah, we got to do this for the energy security, for the economic security and to kickstart the economy. I mean, these are all wonderful palliatives that would certainly register with a significant chunk of people across the community. But, you know, the, the reality is that the fracking process will contaminate our water. First of all, I don't believe that this country has sufficient water supplies to be able to um, uh, resource 
the fracking operation. You know, a year ago, this country was on the brink of a hosepipe ban you know, because we'd had a very dry autumn and winter. And and the concern was that if we had a dry summer, then, uh, you know, basically we were going to be in a world of hurt. I mean, I know the last 12 months has made a complete mockery of that. And now we've got more water than we know what to do with. But, uh, you know, if we suddenly start um, you know, needing nearly 100 million gallons per square mile to uh, uh, frack the um, the shale gas and the coal bed methane, you know, we're, it's not going to take too long before we're finding that we're actually a net importer of fresh water because the fracking operations need fresh water. You cannot use water that has any salinity. Um, so, you know, we don't have any desalination facilities in this country or certainly nothing that could um, produce the quantities that uh, you know this industry is going to require. Coupled with which, bear in mind, it's not pumping just fresh water down there. It's a frac fluid. The nickname is a slick water. It has 5% um, uh, cocktail of uh, contamination. The oil industry is not required to specify the detail of what is in the frac fluid. They throw out palliatives like, yeah, well, there's nothing in there that you can't find in normal domestic products. Well, you know, hey, there's a hell of a lot of domestic products that I wouldn't be mixing with my drinking water. Yeah. So the bottom line is, let me put this in perspective. You, know, you can have your gas or you can have clean water, but you can't have both. Yeah. And as I understand it, we I mean, obviously, we do get a lot of rainfall here in the UK, but the, the, the sort of water table and the the water that we're using drawing from that is built up over a long period of time yep. is quite seriously de depleted and you, you don't have to go underground or talk to a geologist to find out. You can also go along and look at a uh, long-term decline of uh, a lot of reservoirs as well. Sure, absolutely. And I mean, look at what's happening elsewhere in the world. Um, I mean, the uh, oil and gas industry is effectively drawing on the, on the Great Lakes um you know for a lot of its uh, its waters i mean there's major concerns in in places like the triple divide in pennsylvania about the contamination of the water there i mean new york has has put a moratorium on uh, fracking but it's still concerned because um a lot of the new york water supply comes downstream from pennsylvania so if they're fracking in pennsylvania and the water in pennsylvania is getting contaminated then obviously new york state's getting the knock on effect in australia the Great Artesian Basin needs 85 billion gallons of water a year just to replenish naturally. And yet the Australian government have sanctioned the extraction industry, taking half a trillion gallons of water out every year. So, you know, how many years is it going to be before the Great Artesian Basin is, is sucked dry? You know, there, there is potentially something much deeper going on here. And, you know, for any of your listeners that are familiar with Agenda 21, which is the um, the UN sanctioned uh philosophy that emerged from the earth conference in rio in 1992 it's the brainchild of a of a convicted felon by the name of morris strong um but you know agenda 21 talks about you know the long-term goal one being obviously to reduce population um but also to uh to move the population out of the rural areas into controlled environments i.e cities and you know, the reality is that uh, the fracking agenda will achieve that um, to date in Colorado, in Canada and in Australia. The the fracking um, has been primarily in areas of very, very thinly populated countryside. You know, we don't have any areas of thinly populated countryside in this country. I mean, if we do, you know, like Dartmoor, Exmoor, Bodmin Moor, the North York Moors, the Peak District, whatever. You know, nonetheless, they are still not as thinly populated as places like uh, Western Colorado or um, uh, Queensland. So we, we, we have and I have and I present you know, the physical evidence of the impact on those very thinly populated areas. And I show the, the, the very severe um, impacts on the water, the soil, the livestock and the people living in those areas. Well, you know, it's going to be much more aggressive in a place like the UK, which has the population density that's 20 times that of Colorado. Well, when fracking did hit the headlines here in the UK uh, in recent memory, it was it was very negative publicity, um, specifically uh, small earthquakes, earth tremors. And I know that you've spoken of um, uh, friends or colleagues uh, who are living in the area and this affected, uh, well, it's going to affect property values. And that's what you would, almost like similar to living near to a, 
nuclear power plant or an open cast well, mine exactly. or, or maybe even a wind farm. I mean, all these things affect property prices. It doesn't even have to be something as dramatic as an earthquake to get people thinking twice about whether they want to be there anymore. Well, yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right, Greg. In fact, there was a an officially commissioned report that was produced in the uh, online financial publication, This Is Money. And um, that stated that in the report that uh, people who lived within two miles of a gas well could expect to see their property plummet by as much as 24 percent. But the reality is somewhat different and because I first of all, I will share with you the experience of my friends in Blackpool. Um, but also it's the same situation in Colorado, in North Texas, in Pennsylvania, in New Mexico, in Queensland. And, you know, so it's the same wherever. So why would the UK be any different? But you're absolutely right. There hasn't been any fracking in this country since the um, two test wells were drilled and fracked by Quadrilla in the Fylde Peninsula uh, just outside Blackpool. And um, both of those uh uh, fracks resulted in uh, relatively minor seismic events, but nonetheless, they were relatively minor, but nonetheless, they were greater than anything that had occurred in the area for over 100 years. And um, Quadrilla commissioned um, their own report onto uh, what had transpired, and from that report actually acknowledged that it was most probable, I quote, most probable that the seismic events were caused as a direct effect of their, their two frack jobs. Now, after that, there was a moratorium placed on fracking in this country. And to be honest, um, I took my eye off the ball for a little while because I thought, well, OK, you know, that's probably sufficiently significant. And especially when I discovered that the British uh, Geological Society had made a recommendation that um, in future, if there, if there was a return to fracking, then any seismic event greater than 0.5 on the Richter scale um, should be sufficient to call an immediate halt. Well, 0.5 on the Richter scale is absolutely nothing. I mean, you stamp your foot on the floor and that's about 0.5. So I thought, well, pretty much that's the end of it. Um, but what I didn't take into account, of course, was uh, Lord John Brown's uh, commitment to getting this industry kicked off. But anyway, back to my friends in Blackpool. After the uh, earthquake of April 1st, and that was the thing, I mean, a lot of people thought when they read about it, they thought it was an April Fool's joke. Um, but it was April the 1st, 2011. And, uh, you know, my friends were coming up to retirement and they'd already been sort of thinking about what they wanted to do with their retirement. And after the earthquake, they decided, well, this was the, uh, the catalyst they needed to get out. So they have moved to Spain and right now they rent a, a beautiful apartment in the south of Spain. And they got the estate agents round to appraise their beautiful five bedroom house. I mean, it's a couple that live in the house. Uh, the house is, was immaculate. A beautiful location in Port and Lafayette, unfortunately, right over the top of the gas field. So the estate agents came round. They valued the property at 325000 And my friends uh, said, well, great. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. We want to sell it very quickly. Um, we want to put it on the market at 250000 So the, despite the fact that it's on the market for what 30 percent less than it was um, appraised at, they haven't had a single offer. Now, I was actually um, with them in Spain a few weeks ago. And after I came back, because obviously we were talking about this situation. And after I came back, I made a few phone calls to Blackpool estate agents and um, you know, got their input. And I will quote one of them because they all pretty much said the same thing, um, although you know most were fairly uh, evasive. But one guy actually said, he said, you know, um, there is a lot of property coming on the market. Uh, primarily because of the possibility of the return of the fracking operations. And people still remember the earthquakes. And he said that the reality is that the, the properties that are coming onto the market right now will probably never sell. Now, you know, that's not 24 percent. That's a total tanking of the market in North Texas. I um, quote a family by the name of the Ruggerios. Um, who bought a property in 2004 for a quarter of a million dollars. It's a beautiful property just uh, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the hills outside of uh, Dallas. And um, in 2009, the gas industry moved in. They put a, a pad about 300 foot from their back door and started drilling. Um, the operation is 24-7. And 
the they had the property appraised recently and they were told they'd be lucky if they could get seventy five thousand dollars for it. In in reality, the only people that would offer them seventy five thousand is the oil and gas company for the access rights to the property. Now, fracking isn't new. As I understand it, it was first developed back in the 40s. Is there globally any uh, fracking operation or operations that we can look at to see what medium to long term effects have been? Absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, look, in the, for the first 40 odd years, it was relatively benign because when the uh, when Halliburton were running the first frack jobs in the late 1940s, it was ostensibly water and sand. But it's in the 1990s when uh, chemical technology was applied to the, the fracking operation because you know, the, the oil industry obviously wanted to maximize the frack job. So you know, once the chemists, and this is why you know, Schlumberger had a, a partnership with Dow L, you know, this is a partner with Dow Chemical. And so the company was Dow L Schlumberger. Because, you know, the the relationship with Dow Chemical was very significant in terms of developing aggressive frac fluids. Um, and so the the aggressive frac fluids, i.e. frac fluids with a level of toxicity um, that uh, is, is really outrageous, um, was first used in the early 1990s. So you know, the first 40, 50 years or so relatively benign, it's the if you, we need to look at sort of Colorado, where the aggressive frac fluids have been used now for the best part of two decades. Um, and certainly, I mean, I uh, was um, witness to a number of frac jobs when I was based with Schlumberger in North America in the mid 90s. Um, and one of the issues for me is that, you know, I was trotting out the same palliatives to the residents in the uh, in north western Colorado as Quadrilla are trotting out to the residents of um of Blackpool today. And, and one of the films I would recommend people looking at, a lot of people have heard of the film Gasland, but there is a film that in my opinion is way better than Gasland and that's Split Estate. And Split Estate was produced in uh, in early 19, uh, sorry, in, in 2009. Um, and it looks at the effects on the people of Rifle in Northwestern Colorado. Um, and there's some excellent, there's an excellent contribution in that film by a lady by the name of Dr. Theo Colborn, who's one of the world's leading specialists in endocrine disruption. And this is the problem that the gases that sort of migrate out of the, the soil um, and, uh, you know, or, and the um, uh, contamination of the water, uh, you know, contains uh, neuro disruptors, DNA disruptors, uh, ne neuro inhibitors um, and endocrine disruptors. And, and the oil and gas industry is exempted from having to report any contamination thanks to Dick Cheney's you know, Halliburton loophole. In Australia, where they've only been fracking the, uh, the shale there for two to three years, um, I, I show evidence from um, a farm in, in northern New South Wales, it straddles northern New South Wales, southern Queensland, you know, of the, uh, the methane content in the water, of um, uh, methane leaks into streams, uh, which of course obviously impacts on the marine life and uh, of the um, the methane literally in the atmosphere so you know these are it's not a case of people will notice this immediately it's the longer term effects you know and uh, in the film split estate you know this um community that was impacted in northwestern colorado you'll see a couple there that are featured in the film and the the male partner you know, doesn't seem to be unduly affected but the, um, the female partner has gone into early dementia. And uh, Dr. Theo Colborn is absolutely uh, of the opinion that this is of a direct relationship, a direct cause of the uh, exposure to these toxic chemicals. We see this a lot with environmental contamination. Um, it really can be a generational time yes. scale we're talking about. You see that, I mean, even today we're still, well, we're not, but uh, the poor people are still living in India with the union carbide thing. Yep. And of course, there was the recent, relatively recent Gulf oil catastrophe that's never reported on now. And I don't even know what the latest is there, you know, because there's only so many hours in the day. But oh, it's it, a disaster. Yeah. I mean, everything, everything I presented about the Gulf Coast, I, 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 mean, I mean, in 2010, because of obviously, again, my background, I was able to quickly identify what occurred. I was able to pull together a lot of the evidence and I was able to put together a presentation 
uh, where I stated categorically that the individual that really needed to answer some very tough questions was a guy called Bob Kaluza. Um, and uh, you know, BP tried to uh, uh, hide him. Um, and in fact, in my presentations, I show prima facie evidence that the US government is effectively a, uh, a controlled by the corporations, which funnily enough happens to be the definition of fascism. But um, I, I show the prima facie evidence of the Senate refusing the Gulf Coast Coast Guard hearing the power of subpoena, uh, because basically all the senators had been told by the oil industry to block the power of subpoena to the Coast Guard hearing. Well, it meant that we had to work in other ways, but I'm pleased to say that in November of last year, Bob Kaluza was formally charged on 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter. But we still got a long way to go because there are still other people who were on the rig who um, told Kaluza to shut the well in who um, aren't being identified by their respective companies. So, you know, once again, we have classic examples of the oil industry closing ranks, whilst the people who live in that environment, like you rightly say, are still suffering the horrendous effects, not just of the oil, but of the fact that BP sprayed well over a million gallons of Corexit, which is one of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. It's, it's banned almost everywhere else in the world. But BP sprayed it on the oil slick in the Gulf because it made the slick disappear. It sunk the slick, which um, uh, was effectively a requirement um, because BP's lawyers read through the US legislation and they discovered that BP's liability was going to be based upon the size of the visible slick. So somebody came up with a bright idea. Well, let's make it invisible. So what they did was they mixed it with this uh, Corexit, um, which effectively di uh, dispersed the slick, making it even bigger. But it sunk it, thereby making it invisible. But it's caused a massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, you know, the, the phenomenal impact on the health of the people in the area just isn't being reported. And I have, in fact, I have them here with me right now. I have a set of accounts here uh, from the um, BP Deepwater Horizon uh, post disaster uh, operation. And there's a line in the accounts, $52 million spent on behavioral adjustment payments. That's very Orwellian. <laughs> Well, you know, basically anybody who started to uh, make too much of a noise had a visit and it was simply a case of how much do you want? You know, BP has sponsored um, pretty much uh, uh, or, uh, projects in all of the Gulf Coast universities and, and they make a lot of that funding dependent upon the university not questioning anything about BP's operations in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, you only have to stick the phrase dash for gas into a search engine to see what a sort of in vogue uh, catchphrase it is uh, yep. in media and the press and ironically given what we were talking about a few moments ago about property prices and uh, desirability of areas uh, to, to live uh, when certain operations are taking place in this case fracking of course there's talk it, with this dash for gas as the background about this being a boon for the UK yeah. economy and also locally as well in terms of jobs and what have you I mean I've read many media, media articles spinning it yep. that way well yeah, it ain't gonna happen Take my word for it. You know, the, um, the reality is that uh, these operations will be done by specialist personnel. You know, most of the personnel will be bought in from elsewhere. Um, you know, where, where there may be an increase in, uh, in work is obviously on haulage, because another factor is that there's, on average, something like 400 truck journeys per well, you know, because all of the equipment and all of the uh, material for the operation has to be trucked in. And, you know, it, you know, if you're doing that in an area that's very thinly populated, like you know, Western Colorado or Queensland, um, then you know, nobody notices it. But uh, in the UK, you know, six wells, six pads per square mile, 400 truck journeys per well. You know, once this stuff comes off the motorway, it's going to be coming up your side street and it's a 24 seven operation. I mean, anybody, anybody who falls for the propaganda that this is going to be a boon to a location, you know, needs to think again. Now, I know that they will probably use the uh, example, I think it's uh, Wilmington in North Dakota, um, where it, it's, they've just said, yeah, boys come in, drill, baby, drill. And, uh, and of course, there's a phenomenal amount of money in the town right now, um, you know, because you've got all the oil field hands coming in there and, you know, they're, they're on four, uh, four week shit, uh, shifts. 
you know, they do four weeks on, four weeks off, or two weeks on, two weeks off. They come into town, so they need accommodation, you know, they need all the, um, um, the, the, the support services, the bars and everything else. So, yeah, there's a short term boon. It becomes like a like the Wild West or the gold rush all over again. But, um, you know, the, there's a price there's a hell of a price to be paid for that. Now, I saw a uh, map recently, a sort of fracking map, if you will, of uh, Great Britain. And it was showing the areas that were, I'm not quite sure what the terms were, whether it was suitable for fracking. I suppose it was maybe target areas where they thought this could work. And there weren't that many areas. Um, uh, but uh, it's 64% well, of England. Is it? Wow. OK, well, 64% of England sits over shale uh, deposits. The target areas, the, the target areas in this order will be um, um, the Fylde Peninsula, which is the area outside Blackpool. The uh, uh, the central Scotland belt running right across um, you know, Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, the southwest of England, the Mendips and the coal bed, the coal bed methane across the uh, the Severn estuary and the coal bed methane deposits in South Wales. Then it'll be the shale gas in um, uh, Sussex. In fact, the, the whole of the south of England right across Sussex right across uh, um, the, M, the the southernmost point is just north of the M4, then right across down to, to Devon. All of that basically sits above shale. And and the focus will be the area just north of Brighton around uh, Balkham. Then we have the area in the Wirral and in Liverpool. And in fact, there's been some natural um, uh, immersions of uh, methane in those areas for well over 100 years. So, you know, there's some stuff there that's pretty easy to tap into. And then the East Midlands. And the East Midlands, you know, basically centred probably on uh, Melton Mowbray, but Leicestershire, uh, Derbyshire, you know, right up into southern Yorkshire. So, you know, these are the areas. And once they start, once they have achieved social sustainability, this is the phrase you're going to read in the media, social sustainability. And basically that means where the, the propaganda has been so powerful that the, the population have been sort of browbeaten into accepting that it's just going to be drill, baby, drill. Um, so once they start this, they're not going to stop because it is the low hanging fruit. And it's only the low hanging fruit right now because basically they're not um, concerned about the longer term effects. They're just going into the ground, pumping down an aggressive frac fluid, seeking the greatest possible return, regardless of the longer term impact and the longer term cost. You know, the other fact, fact that the people aren't taking account of, you know, what about the what about the health effects? You know, in the US, unless people have health insurance, they're responsible for, you know, their own um, health care costs. And if they haven't got the money, they die. You know, in this country, you know, we still have at least the, the remnants of a, of a national health service. And, you know, what's going to happen when people start to get sick in significant quantities because they're living over, you know, areas of uh, that are generating high levels of toxicity? It'll be interesting to see in terms of national politics and local politics uh, where resistance comes from in terms of, you know, it's one thing to put one over in a particular community that maybe isn't very well represented or resourced, but quite another if you were going to do something in, you know, in Surbiton, where there was a lot of uh, well-connected, influential people. Oh, I, I, I mean, let's let's be uh, clear about it. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit surprised, to be honest, that uh, they've even tried to float the idea of drilling in um, in Sussex, because obviously that's an area, it, it's the southeast, it's commuter belt, um, and it's uh, it's heavily populated um so I, I was a bit surprised when uh, you know quadrilla announced that they were going to um use the petroleum exploration development licenses they'd acquired in that area and drill some wells now there was a public meeting there last year which was a complete disaster for quadrilla and, and in fact that's what led to the ceo of quadrilla being changed and a smooth talking irishman by the name of francis egan being brought in to replace the um uh brash um, American Mark Miller. Oh, Ian, all Irishmen are smooth talking. Oh, is that right? I guess, I guess you're. I guess you're Irish, Craig. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, Francis Egan. He's a lovely guy. You know, I mean, these these guys are very personable. Um, but you know, obviously, they, they have a they have 
industrial denial, cognitive dissonance, whatever you want to call it, you know, because their focus is getting this stuff out of the ground. Um, but you know, they, they will be going for these areas. And, and the British government, and of course, with Lord John Brown at the heart of British government, they've already thought about this issue of local challenges. That's why the Growth and Infrastructure Bill, which has just received royal assent, by the way, I mean, it was presented to MPs and it was one of the fastest bills to ever go through Parliament. I think it went through in something like 55 days. Um, but it was presented to MPs as a vehicle by which uh, bureaucracy could be removed from uh, small businesses. And, and that, I believe, is the sort of party line and why it was that basically MPs just effectively railroaded it straight through. But there's another element to this growth and infrastructure, bi infrastructure bill, and, and that is that um, it also provides the opportunity for the British government, if it decrees that something is so critical to the well-being of the country, i.e. In, in terms of energy security or the economy, they can literally ignore any local or regional opposition to set something in motion. So consequently, I believe that the reason that Quadrilla have announced that they will not drill in 2013 and they're going to delay their operations now until 2014 and the reason that UK Methane have withdrawn all of their planning applications um, to drill in Somerset is not because they're withdrawing in any way, shape or form. They are simply biding their time and they are waiting for the full extent of the growth and infrastructure legislation to come into play and to be given the green light by central government, regardless of any local opposition. And at, at that point, at that point, all that leaves for the local population is um, direct action, which is basically what's happening in uh, Australia right now. And um, they have an opposition group called uh, Lock the Gate. And, um, and despite the fact that, you know, they're in um, uh, very thinly populated areas, you know, people come from hundreds of miles to blockade and to prevent the rigs from getting onto the pads because it's the only way that they've got now uh, to stop them. Well, you know, my my sense is that if you have to resort to direct action, then you've probably lost because, you know, the full weight of the the um, establishment will be behind the operation. I think what we've got to do, and that's why I'm doing the tour in the way I'm doing it, which is you know, to reach out to communities far and wide in the UK to get people to take a look at this for themselves. I always say uh, that I don't expect people to take anything I say at face value. You know, they don't need to because we've got this wonderful tool, at least for the time being, called the web. You know, People will go away from my events and, and check out the facts for themselves. In fact, I got an email from somebody who came to one of my events last week and said, oh, my goodness, you know, we, we left the event and didn't go to bed until three o'clock because we were up talking about it and watching one of the films, i.e. Split Estate, that I'd uh, recommended. And, you know, other people have written to their MPs. And in fact, I have I won't mention the MP for obvious reasons. But in fact, I have the reply right here. It's a very simple reply because it was from his iPad. Um, but this is yeah, one of the people who came to my uh, talk. They immediately set about writing to their MP. And this is the response. Um, dear, blah, blah, blah. I am not convinced by the anti-fracking lobby. Underground drilling needs to be done sensitively. But this country has led the world in this area. And if we ensure that environmental safety is prioritized, I feel we could exploit these reserves safely. I accept that to do so, we need a much tougher regime than that which is presently Oh, sorry, the English here isn't that great than that which presently is effectively non-existent. He's talking about regulatory um, authority here. Now, you know, first of all, Lord John Brown is at the heart of British government. He's the non-executive director on the cabinet, effectively. He is the chairman of Coastal Oil and Gas, which um, is a uh, major shareholder in uh, Quadrilla. And he also has a track record when he was chairman and chief executive officer of um, uh, BP um, with a body count that would make the Clintons blush. So, uh, in fact, um, you know, there were many people who were staggered that uh, um, Lord John Brown didn't have to face charges because his mantra when he was chairman and chief executive officer of BP was profit before all else. 
And consequently, you know, we had um, uh, cuts in health and safety um, right across the whole BP infrastructure. You know, there were uh, horrendous leaks in pipelines. There was the refinery explosion in um, Texas. And, you know, Brown never acknowledged that he had any responsibility for this, despite the fact he was the man at the helm. And it was well known that when BP took over uh, Amoco in the US, that uh, Amoco, who had prided themselves in trying to protect protect the Arctic tundra on the north slope of Alaska, that once BP took ownership, basically all that was lost because it was regarded as an unnecessary cost. So, you know, John Brown eventually left um, a BP, not because of the issues regarding health and safety, but because basically he was caught lying about his personal life. And uh, in fact, he lied to the courts. You know, so this is this is a mark of the man's integrity. He lied to the courts for two weeks, claiming that he had met his uh, gay lover on um, while he was jogging in Battersea Park. When in reality, it subsequently emerged that he met him on a gay dating web website called Booting and Booted and Suited. And and once that emerged, obviously his integrity was called into to doubt. And he 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 had already announced that he was planning to resign from BP, but he left early. But then two years later, he's at the heart of British government, um, unelected, working with David Cameron on um, you know, bringing business ethics into Parliament. And this is the guy. This is the guy who in I think it was November of last year. Uh, so one month before the moratorium was lifted, uh, basically said, we will do whatever it takes to establish the shale gas drilling um, industry in the UK. Yes, well, sadly, such is the the world of uh, sleaze that we live in, that most people won't really be surprised by any of those um, well, it, revelations. The, unfortunately, the MPs there, you know, for many of them, I know how tough it is for an MP. They're run ragged. I mean, they are they are given so many projects to look at. You know, they've got their issues with their own constituents, you know, plus the broader issues that they don't really get a chance to look at the deeper element. And, you know, I've spoken to a couple of MPs who are part of the new intake you know, because after we had the MPs expenses scandal, obviously a lot of the existing MPs didn't get reelected. So there's a whole batch of new, well, in, and in many, many cases, young blood there. But they're beginning to realise that they are nothing more than division fodder. They're not given any responsibility. You know, they're treated like mushrooms, you know, fed shite and kept in the dark. Um, and they're just told through the three line whip, you know, which way to vote. So you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction amongst the uh, these more junior MPs right now. And that may be that may be, you know, advantageous to us, because if we can actually get them to be objective and look at the evidence for um, you know, what I'm sharing here, the, i.e. the uh, horrendous ecological nightmare that will be unleashed, which will result in genocide effectively in those areas. If we can get them to look at this objectively, we can get it shut down. If, on the other hand, unfortunately, they've got their snouts in the trough and they have started to uh, realise that, you know, if they just play the game, then life is pretty nice on a material level. All you got to do is sell your soul. I mean, if that if that's the case, then we really do seriously have an uphill battle. Well, Ian, as we begin to close things down for today, perhaps you could say something. And we really have only scratched the surface of the many issues that are interrelated here. Perhaps you could just say something about what we should be looking for, perhaps so, I mean, you mentioned the phrase social sustainability. I don't know if there's any buzzwords or any timeline events which would indicate uh, things that would be significant that we should be paying attention for. So if you've got any thoughts in that area and then please share with people the detail of your uh, website, dates on your tour, everything that they need to know and that you'd like to share. Thanks, Greg. Uh, first of all, let's um, uh, look at an alternative because, you know, I've, I've obviously spent the best part of the last 45 minutes or whatever um, stating that, you know, there's no way we should be fracking on land. Well, first of all, as I've, I want to reiterate, you know, I'm not a defender in any way, shape or form of the hydrocarbons industry. I know what a grip the hydrocarbons industry has on the global economy. And, uh, you know, so we've got to be realistic. Ultimately, you know, I would just love for one of the alternative uh, free energy devices to go viral so viral that it was unstoppable because that would force a complete rethink of this total economic construct. 
But while we're staying with the uh, hydrocarbon construct for the duration, the alternative to this is to encourage people to look or for MPs, for our elected representatives, for the industry to look at the subsea methane hydrates, because you know Japan has, has had some success, some considerable success with tapping into the subsea methane hydrates. And arguably, there are more reserves in these um, deposits than we could ever consider requiring for the next 150, 200 years. Now, like I've said before, you know, we've, we've got that wrong in the past, so maybe it's wrong again. But the bottom line is it's offshore. I mean, I would certainly acknowledge that we should be looking at trying to avoid fracking, period. But if we've got to frack, if we've got to stay with the hydrocarbons industry for the time being, let's get it offshore. Let's be sure that we are protecting the uh, fresh water supplies for this generation and for future generations. You know, by the way, I just wanted to share with you, the Mexican government has formally um, registered its disapproval with the American government because what it perceives as the American oil industry in Texas, it, it, it perceives its um, its attitude to be uh, uh, a total cowboy stance. And because there's no requirement for them to report the polluting or contamination of water, they are polluting, in, in the opinion of the Mexican government, they are polluting very, very deep aquifers. And these aquifers that the Mexican government says, you know, aren't necessary for the current generation, but you know, may become critical in the future. And obviously it doesn't bode well if the American oil industry is deliberately polluting them. So, you know, we've, we've got to look at the alternatives. So subsea methane hydrates is an area that I would encourage people to, uh, to take a look at. The other thing that we're looking at, by the way, is that we are looking at um, the potential uh, legal angle. In fact, there's a wonderful piece of um, case law that actually dates back to the 19th century called uh, Rylands versus Fletcher, which looks at the liability of any individual who um, does anything that ultimately leads to contamination. And, and if this piece of legislation can be um, properly interpreted, it may well be that this is the panacea that we're looking for to actually stop this happening. Because if the oil industry and indeed those who sanction it realize that they are going to be potentially liable for any downstream impact, then it might just get them to uh, um, pause and uh, take a second look at it. But, uh, you know, I don't think right now we have the panacea. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a multi-pronged attack. And that's why I'm running the tour. The tour is pretty much every weeknight all around the country for the next uh, 13 weeks. Um, the details of the tour are on my website, which is Ian R. Crane, I-A-N-R-C-R-A-N-E, ianrcrane.com. And of course, Ian, you uh, quite often in the past have um, recorded and filmed some of your presentations, haven't you, and made them available for people who, you know, worldwide? Yes, indeed. And um, I mean, we're in the process of putting together, um, you know, the, the video of the uh, the presentation, and uh, hopefully that'll be available in the next sort of two or three weeks. Excellent. Well, Ian R. Crane, thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please check out the website where you'll find an archive of programs on many equally fascinating topics. And if you'd like to find out more about the subjects discussed today, I remind you that Ian remains out on tour in the UK until July 26th. You can find all the details and buy tickets at his website, ianrcrane.com. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.